you know, working in the marketing department, uh, kind of doing like graphics and whatnot, and then became the social media manager. I also became a full-time member of our sales team. And so I was working, I, I would often work from libraries. Libraries, I, I love them. They're a national treasure. I don't think a lot of people appreciate them for what they are and they're silent. So it was a great place to work, which was a complete antithesis uh, mm -hmm. to working in an office, which I really have no intention of ever doing again. When I think back, working in an office and how many distractions there were uh you know it's it's incredible and my productivity is way up and i was mm -hmm. fortunate because i started working from home for my previous company uh, a year before the pandemic um and like i said i was working remotely from there but i was usually at libraries or coffee shops things of that nature yeah so, it's weird it's because i i agree with you on the libraries solid wi-fi quiet and the only thing you really had to worry about was kids and that was fine but yeah. but then on the opposite side i would go to starbucks or i would go to a i mean this is since 2009 just mm -hmm. to get that that buzz in the background right just you yeah. know i didn't know anyone but there was always something going on and if if it was too much i could just leave and or or then put my headphones on i've done that i mean this mm -hmm. you know last year or, you know even during covid but yeah that was pretty cool um, and it was interesting to see everyone as I'm sure you did the same thing. Come, come to it and go. Oh my gosh, how am I going to do this? Man, it works. You do it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, some people gen genuinely don't like it. I mean, I know people who choose to work yeah. in an office because uh, it's you know it's the best environment for them to be their best. That's totally not for me. And uh, you know, it, it's interesting to see the work from home movement expand as it's going. Obviously, we were headed in that direction anyway, but the pandemic right. like hypercharged how quickly we adopted these technologies and just started doing it and um i mean i love being able to work from home and you know if i want to i can go to a library or a coffee shop uh it's interesting you bring up uh you like that sound of people in the background i must admit there is something to white noise or chatter if it's a certain level it is conducive to writing better yeah it's weird it's it's you're part of it but then you're separated from it because you don't really care you know what i mean it's to me at least um it's not like there's chatter over the cubes because mm. no matter what, there's always something that someone wants to talk about and you want to hear, you know, somehow you're drawn into the I didn't even watch the Super Bowl, but everyone's talking about the Super Bowl. So I guess I'll talk <laughs> about the Super Bowl or stuff like that. Yeah. So it's crazy. All right. Well, hang on. So let me do a quick intro here and then I'll pull you in and uh, we'll go live here. All right. Hey. Sounds yep. good. All right. Welcome, welcome back to the Greg Walter Show. It's uh, ooh, it's two twenty three, two thousand twenty three. So February of twenty twenty three. What's going on today? Let's see. In the news, our fearless leader was in Poland and the Ukraine giving a speech. Uh, the president. It, it it looks like. I mean, there were lots of crowds there. Um, good or bad, it looks like the largest crowd he's ever had at one of his uh, speeches took place in Poland. So he got he has more followers in Poland than here it seems. And I'm just joking. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's see chat AI is still hot right now and it's going to be hot for a while. So everything let's see it's it's came out in November. People are talking about it. We're starting to get into the ethics of artificial intelligence. The big companies are throwing around their money and their weight trying to trying to jostle for position. Meanwhile, there are at least and this is offhand, but I've talked to dozens, and I'm sure you can multiply that by 10 or 100, of smaller firms that weren't considering integrating or doing an API into any AI that are now doing it. And it's moved up from the whiteboard. You know, the whiteboard project list was Q2 of 24. No, they're developing, and they, and they want Q1 or Q2 of this year. So that's happening right now. Chat GPT is the hot thing. Um, we'll see where that goes. In our industry... In the copier industry, office technology, the remote work still impacting what we're doing. I think I've been a participant in and, and seen some data come out of some studies here. Now we're finally getting some good data and studies that um, CIOs and the technology folk in the corporate world who are really supporting hybrid or promoting hybrid. For us in the office technology industry, there's still room. They may not buy 15 copiers, but the people that do go to the office are going to need the print and are going to need the copy. So there is some demand there. And there's even words that demand has shifted off to work from home. So, yeah, that small little printer or whatever. But the technology 
actually has to be avail- available in two different environments. So it isn't going to double the business, but it's a 1.5 or at least stay on par. Those are the rumors out there right now. Um, so, yeah, this is season two of the show and episode three or four, I forget. Uh, the gentleman I'm pulling in today is a, f- a colleague and a friend that I've known for a while. And, again, that's why I like to pull in in these shows. And I'll let him tell his story, but it's very interesting. It's right there in, um, oh, wow, I didn't know that kind of thing. And and it, um, we were talking earlier is that it was, it's, it's always nice to know people, as you know, in the industry. We've all got other things that are happening, other hobbies, you know, anything, wild stuff. Um, and for some reason, COVID kind of brought that to the forefront more, more often than not. People are, you know, instead of talking about what you did at work, you're talking about what you did in the off time, you know, if you anything from collecting stamps to, uh, I don't know, going woodworking, but it's, we found a lot of, the, you know, we haven't found, we've been exposed to the multiple dimensions that we've all had, but work got in the way of that. So anyway, in that vein, I want to bring in Nathan, um, and have him tell you a little bit. I'm going to ask him some questions. We're going to get into some really funky Comedina stuff. Um, anyone has any questions, go ahead and hit us up for it. Let me see if I can. Pull this in here. Oh, there we go. Hey, Nathan. How hey, you doing? Going? I'm doing great. How are you today, Greg? It is wonderful. It is. Oh, actually, I should have said this. Um, I'm down in Florida, so it's going to be hot today. It's already 80. It's going to be like 91 in February. So that's really, really hot for these people. I'm so, jealous yeah. because I'm up in New England, and <laughs> there is a sheet of ice coating everything. Currently, I normally go for a morning walk, and today I said I'm going to wait till after the uh, uh, the interview because uh, it's just kind of dreary, miserable, and slick outside right now. So I'm jealous. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's weird. We get a whole like a 60 or 70 degree difference between the north and the south right now. So it's one of those. Now it's weird, but it's not that uncommon. It's happened before. No one should freak out. You know, there's no hole in the ozone yet. That was back in the 70s. Anyway, so so Nathan, real quick. Now, I, you know, we've been, we've known each other for a while. Give for the audience just a brief introduction of who you are. And then, you know, talk a little bit about how you were in the industry and then popped out. And Because I think you're one of the few that gets out and stays out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was, uh, you know, after I got out of the industry, I was offered a couple jobs to enter back in. But at the time, having completed over a decade uh, in the managed print services and copier industry, uh, I did want to try something different. And I ultimately did. Um, But I'll always cherish my time in the copier industry. And who knows that there could be a point in the future where maybe if there's the right opportunity, it's something I would consider. Um, But I built my career in sort of an unorthodox way. Uh, I don't have a college degree, uh, but I always like to tell people, well, I don't have a university education. My work has been taught to students at uh, university, specifically Rutgers University, under Professor Mark Schaefer, who uh, is a gentleman who really helped to launch my career. uh, let's see, we go back to 2006. I spent the next three years getting you know, used to working in an office, uh, getting used to working with the technology that I would ultimately be selling one day. Mm-hmm. Um, and I became increasingly uh, angry with uh, copiers as time went on. And um, that's where the idea for the Destroy Your Printer contest came, which is what pretty much everybody oh, knows right. me for. Yeah, I remember that. That's right. Okay, cool. Yeah, I mean, it was on a whim. Um, I had been working in the marketing department as a graphic designer uh, and I told my boss like, hey, we should be involved in social media. Now, this is going back 2008 ish. So uh, for B2B is not as much exposure as you see today. And they said, well, we don't get it. And uh, I was like, well, just give me a shot. And they're like, all right. So put together a presentation. We'll have a board meeting. Uh, The uh, CEO, president, vice president, um, our finance guy and our sales manager was there. So I did a pitch about what I guess you'd call the big four or five. So at the time that for me was LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. And at the end, they're like, yeah, you know what? This makes sense. you got six months and $0 budget uh, to see if you can get anything done. Perfect. Uh, and that's when I came up with uh, the Destroy Your Printer contest, because the one thing I always wanted to do at some point in the day when I came to work was take a sledgehammer to a copier. Uh, and I said, why not do that? Um, and so basically, you know, the, the contest was inviting people to creatively and humorously destroy a piece of office equipment. It could be a fax machine, copier, printer, whatever. And uh, it was extremely well received. The contest was so uh, well done that it, we continued doing it annually for about five years. 
Uh, and it was Professor Mark Schaefer at Rutgers University who uh, was writing for his Grow marketing blog. Um, one of the blogs at the time, along with yours, Death of the Copier, and some other blogs that I had been uh, reading and commenting on, uh, got a hold of the story and you know, wrote an article about it. And mm. then from there, the New York Times picked it up and it just exploded from there. Um, so, I mean, that's that's pretty much uh, my career in a nutshell up until 2017 uh, when uh, I left the company and went to the role that I had just been previously doing, but I'm, I'm not currently there. Uh, I work for a packaging company. But as far as, you know, the copier industry is concerned, um, I learned so much uh, in addition to being uh, the social media manager. Um, I was a full-time member of the sales team. I was a member of the Managed Print Services Association. I spent a lot of time mm -hmm. reading Death of the Copier. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, it was a fantastic time in my life. And I, I just learned so much about technology, um, about the art of selling. And, you know, from 2009 till 2017, I spent my days uh, marketing and selling uh, copiers, managed print services, software, and related items. Wow. Wow. I forgot about the... Uh the destroy your copier thing. That was cool. <laughs> that was pretty cool. And it, I remember it because it's, you know, of course, it strikes such a common thread. Uh, uh, you don't have to be the industry to appreciate the fact that you want to <laughs> take a sledgehammer to a copier. That That is, you know, one of the threads in the fabric of business life. Everyone hated the copier. And then, you know, it made our job a little more difficult because we were the ones <laughs> selling the dang things. <laughs> yeah. 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 Wow. So that's cool. And I like what you said about, you know, that's why I learned about the it, you know, it's pitched the industry. It's a tough thing to do, really. It really is. All sales is tough. But if, and I've said this, if you can get into copier sales and you can sell people copiers, you can pretty much do anything. You can sell, you can move and pivot to any, any, any industry, which is cool. So, all right. Now I knew that and I forgot about it, but I'm glad you brought that up. Now, now I, so there was a gentleman I talked to a couple weeks ago, two times. He now, his, he and his family are into <coughs> bur bourbon tasting and analyzing bur I mean, and it, and they've, reviewed hundreds in the last two years and and these guys are serious about it so they've got like content up the wazoo you know i just drink it enjoy it and know what i like and now i've had maybe eight or nine hundred different samples in the last three years wow. so that but that's the whole you know i had a side thing going on anyway my point there is that they were in the industry he was in the years got out of the industry he's out of the industry and now is doing something that he loves now now I want to hear your story as to what you're doing, not on the side, but that's at your core. I know, I believe it. The the music and yeah. and the creative artistic side of of you, and maybe if you can talk about how either one side enhanced the other or is mm -hmm. intertwined and, and stuff like that. But for the audience, explain where your music is, what it comes from, and then the, the art side of it as well. Yeah, sure. So um, I've been a musician uh, gigging out since I was 14. Uh, my first band at the time was called Crimson Breeze, and we had a residency uh, for like three years every Thursday uh, at this coffee shop. Um, oh, I can't remember the name of it. It's It's been so long since I've been there. And yeah, I started playing guitar at the age of six. I didn't take it seriously until 10, at which point I took lessons. And when I had enough lessons, because I'm an autodidact and I'm a very, you know, uh, one to teach myself. I, I, I took the lessons to get like a basis in theory because the fundamentals of that will certainly help you. And if, if you're thinking of picking up an instrument, you should at least learn basic music theory. Uh, but after about a year or two, I pretty much just spent four to eight hours a day practicing my guitar um, from the age of 10 forward. And there was my first band at the age of 14 and I was in several uh, over the course of the years, but it was in 2006, June of 2006, um, uh, I was giving bass lessons uh, to my friend, uh, Travis Swenny, um, who eventually ended up becoming one of my best friends. And about a year or so after I started his lessons, we were spending time just jamming together. So I was like, you know, we're, 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 we're jamming. I'm not going to charge you for lessons. Like, you're, you know, you've learned quite a bit. And from there, we uh, put together a band with some other friends of ours called Jibuta. Uh, that band toured for a little over a decade. Um, and we were able to gain international fame um, through a marketing campaign uh, talking about how, you know, work affects the band or band affects work. Uh, I just printed up some stickers that says, what is Jabuda? There was no URL on the original stickers, just what is Jabuda? Mm -hmm. And these stickers ended up all over the U.S. We were getting, I mean, this goes, this, this, I'm dating myself here, but I think our first social media page was a MySpace. 
and we were getting messages from all over the country. I believe we, we, we eventually saw at least one sticker sighting from all 50 states. And then uh, we started okay. seeing international uh, feedback. Uh, there's, there's one on that unfinished uh, famous cathedral in Spain. There's a bus stop in front of it. Uh, somebody sent us a photo from there. Uh, there was a sticker on the outside of a theater in Amsterdam uh, and another one in the UK. Uh, so, you know, through this uh, <laughs> marketing ploy, which really just got people to Google the name Jabuda, and being that it's a very eclectic word, we were back then already ranking number one for it. Um, so through uh, that marketing campaign and through word of mouth, um, we started, you know, very basic playing shows in our friend's backyard or house parties. Eventually, we started playing at a venue nearby called um, the Mill Street Brews and the Artist Development Center. We mm. must have played over 200 shows there over the course of the decade. And of course, we were touring all over the Northeast. So Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, uh, New York. We went down to New Jersey, Pennsylvania. Um, but the Mill was sort of like our home base. It's where our, you know, our, we built our fan base uh, and was really where we had that, like the biggest and best shows. And during that time, we were extremely, um, uh, well, it was a gift really when, when I think about it. Uh, there was major touring artists coming through this facility and because we were so ingrained with the staff, we were friends with the owner, we got to open for some legendary musicians. Uh, my band, Jabuda, has opened for members of the Grateful Dead, uh, keyboardist uh, Tom Constantin and singer Donna Jean Godchow. Um, we opened for Dickie Betts from the Allman Brothers, and we did two shows playing with blues legend uh, Johnny Winter, which was probably one of the most mind-blowing experiences I had because uh, as we were an act, we had backstage access. And so I was able to, you know, rub elbows with some of these folks and talk right. about touring and the business side of things. And uh, like Johnny, Johnny Winter's uh, camper was out back, and I went and knocked on the door just to see if he would come out. And sure enough, he did. And he looked at me and he goes, where's Mojo? I was like, what? Where's Mojo? He had an assistant who, you know, took care of him. I mean, I think he was in his 70s or 80s at the time. This was about oh, wow. 10 years ago. And yeah, I mean, he, he looked very frail and you could tell like, you know, that the, the years of uh, touring had taken its toll. But he came out on stage, he sat down, plugged his guitar in and just blew everyone's minds. Like mm -hmm. it's just truly one of the great uh, blues guitar legends. And he dedicated a song to my father that evening for what that's worth. Um, so that's cool. Yeah. So, I mean, art and music have always been something that's extremely important to me. I was drawing since at least the age of six, probably earlier. Mm -hmm. um, music became my number one passion by the time I was age 10. And I noticed you're on my website. If uh, there's a music page there, there's a bunch of uh, live recordings from uh, several of my bands. Uh, but there's also, yeah, that will take you to uh, my Bandcamp page. I have, mm -hmm. a, I believe I'm currently up to 11 solo studio albums. Some of the music, which uh, if you guys were here early, you might have heard it before we began our meeting today. But yeah, um, art, particularly digital art. I mean, I drew a lot when I was a kid, but I really love using a Macintosh computer and Canva and Adobe and things of that nature. Uh, I, I just always loved creating visual art. And, you know, I fell in love with the guitar at age 10. So those things have been completely integral um, to my experience. Right. And, you, and you asked me, you know, do, you know, so does your work help with the band does the band help sure. work uh understanding how to sell you know learning how to uh, have a contract um learning how to uh, to haggle with people uh absolutely helped us when um you know working to get shows and what that entailed whether you know what the pay is you know do we have access to a green room so uh, the whole yeah yeah the whole negotiation the whole so okay there's a lot here um yeah. So what I, you know, I've, I've talked about this millions of times with just by being doing what we do when by we, I mean, everyone who sells and makes things happen that those transferable skills are there forever and can mm. be used no matter where you go. We hone them here. And I hate the, the mundane activity of selling and for now, just use a copier, but it could be whatever it is, a, a machine out back, a manufacturing machine, a fleet of trucks, a uniform, doesn't matter. Whatever it is, somebody is providing another company, the logistics involved in that, the brain power that has to go into actually bringing something from some other place into another place of business it's it's unless it's a small, small, even in the smaller business, the decision process. The ability to get a truck there. I mean, to get right down into the weeds, a lot goes on. 
And so you could certainly look at booking bands and band, you know, I've worked with bands for a couple of years booking bands and there is talk about logistics and and the the and the sales you think band people don't sell, right? They're not sales people. They hate sales people. Mm -hmm. You sell every time you get on the stage, dude. That's what happens. So, you know, people are buying or not buying every 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 time you're up there. Um but uh, you know, back to your original it's like, yeah, if you're in this you, you can take these skills back and forth, but so I can already tell that that the marketing side of you and the creative side really helped out with the marketing side of 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 the business, right? The, the you know destroy your copiers, um, the the analogy between the the bumper sticker, which maybe folks bumper stickers actually went on a bumper <laughs> of a car, <laughs> yeah. you know, back in the olden days, right. and it was the only it was the best way for you know bands, radio stations, whatever it was to get your brand out there out there mm. into the public and yeah so it would be neat to see your sticker or whatever it was you created show up all over the world because that mm. was your twitter that was your facebook that was your social media back then totally. you know, yeah so but now see that brings up great and i want to get to the psychedelics but so you've been on the creative side and as long as you've been through this transition multiple transitions right from stickers and bumper stickers to facebook you know you mentioned my face facebook linkedin you know you've done that and then even on the creative side right from mm. sitting at a table somewhere with the i don't know whatever artists use paintbrush and stuff to now you mentioned it canva and all the electronic stuff so give some insight on that that journey okay mm -hmm. um and maybe how you feel because the next question is okay and then let's bridge into this ai thing that's that's hitting yeah. hard right now right yeah so yeah how you know what are your reflections because you know you went you know, i'm sure you still use the old tools but talk about the transition into i mean it doesn't matter if it's good or bad because it is but we're, we're, what are your thoughts on that whole evolution and then you know talk a little bit about what you think where it's going to go with ai yeah, sure. So I mean, I've been using desktop publishing software such as the Adobe Creative Suite since a very young age. I think the first time I, I ever used it, I was eight years old. And this is in part because uh, my mother is a graphic designer who used to work for a local newspaper uh, for close to 40 years, I believe. And so she instilled uh, an interest in art, specifically graphic design at a very young age. And so you mentioned the stickers. Yeah, on one hand, that's, you know, um, that's the hands-on physical type of marketing where you have stickers or flyers for the show, um, which all these things are actually still relevant, particularly for bands, uh, maybe not as much in you know, say the copier industry uh, as far as event uh, marketing is concerned. Um, but you know, getting on the ground floor of uh, Expert Laser Services, which was the managed print services provider that I had uh, worked with, um, I got superior training in the Adobe Creative Suite. Uh, and uh, that eventually uh, leads to up to today using Canva. I like Canva a lot more uh, than Adobe Photoshop and some of the related uh, softwares, not because they're not good. Adobe is the gold standard. Um, mm -hmm. However, they're so complicated. Uh, I had taken a, a training course at a hotel, uh, like a two day seminar for Adobe Photoshop. And one of the things that the teacher said at the beginning was, if you dedicated eight hours a day, five days a week to just studying uh, Adobe Photoshop, after 40 years, you would have learned less than half of what the software can do, which is great. But I never thought it was terribly user friendly. So the great thing about Canva is it gives you a lot of the functionality that a, a really robust creative tool like Adobe um, is mm -hmm. going to give you, but makes the whole process a lot easier. Um, so I was lucky as a child, uh, K through six, uh, the school that I went to, they had a computer class. So every year, uh, starting with the Apple two E's, uh, I don't know if you remember those. Oh yeah. Yep. I had um, one. Yeah. So did I, uh, you know, I started playing like Oregon trail with my classmates and then I was really grateful for the computer class looking back in retrospect because the teacher, you know, by the time we were in like fourth and fifth grade, uh, she taught us how to use animation software. There's a very popular kid software that I think still exists today called KidPix. Uh, and that particular mm. version 
uh, had uh, the ability to create animations. I was already doing that at home because I was blown away that there was a tool that I as a child could use to make animated uh, content, video games, movies, whatever. And so I really excelled at that. And, you know, from the time I was in kindergarten till today, there's not a year that has gone by that I haven't had access uh, and used a computer. Wow. So that was not my history. I, I you know, it was, uh, it was, I was still out of high, I got out of high school when the 2E came in, but we had one back at home when I was yeah. going to college. Interesting. Okay. So, so would you agree with that? I mean, the tools that let's take, a, do you think the tools that evolve from during your lifetime has either enhanced or replaced, have they replaced other artisans or people in that field? Or has it enhanced the field in general? And and I'll use a, a, a real basic um, example. So, so I grew up outside Detroit where we would go to, um, you know, our field trips would go to uh, automotive plants, right, and watch them make cars. That was pretty nice. cool. That is uh, yeah. cool. And, uh, you know, I remember going in and watching the guys at the weld, you know, the big line, big welders, and then the paint booth, right? You had guys, people in there spray painting cars, right? That's effectively what I saw. I mean, I'm probably yeah. oversimplifying it. But these guys were artisans because if you think about hundreds of cars coming through in one shift and they, all the paint has got to look the same, it's got to mm -hmm. be identical. Well, I remember the day the first paint robot came in and it was devastating and awesome all at the same time because now you've got a machine that works three shifts and can do hundreds of cars in a shift continuously laser guided perfect every single time and mm. we're not going to have one booth we're going to have 12 of these paint booths it's like holy smokes so the shock to the system was huge that particular system and i remember that so have you seen anything similar in the of course you have. What what have you seen? What are your comments on that in the art world and creativeness and stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, I, I knew about chat GPT well before the public started talking about it so much. And it's something that I had been keeping an eye on and I've used to some extent. Um, mm, and so, okay. it, yeah, I mean, well, I'll just be, you know, I'll be honest here. Um, last year, um, as an experiment, I wrote an article with it. I did an organic meeting. I wrote it myself, intro and outro. About 85% of the text, the body, uh, mm -hmm. was from ChatGPT. Uh, and in order, like at the time, there wasn't even tools out um, to test for AI because the articles about how Google is going to penalize you if you, uh, you know, have X percentage hadn't even come out yet. But I knew that yeah, that right. was where this is going. Um, so traditionally, when I was writing a blog post as a uh, um, as a content manager at my previous company, which was part of my role as a digital marketing specialist, would be to blog. Uh, now, I entered the industry knowing nothing, just like I did in the copier industry when I was you know, 22, uh, whatever it was. Um, and the way that I was able to uh, become a, a thought leader, because you know, some of my articles have been published in the biggest um, trade publications uh, in the industry, which is the same kind of path that I took uh, when working in the copier industry, the way I did that was interviewing subject matter experts. Um, so, you know, I would sit down with the sales manager, uh, sales reps, people from our supply chain division. I would pick their brains. I would write everything down. And I know that everything I have is factually correct. So at that point, I would take it and I would do my magic with it. I would put it in something that it was easy to read, hopefully entertaining and uh, it, gives the people the ability to learn something new about packaging they didn't know before. Mm. Now to do that well, to do that right at the level of quality that, you know, I wanted and that my uh, employer wanted, uh, it took eight hours just to write the post. So completed the post, uh, you know, I would spend about eight hours on it. Then another eight hours, give or take for editing, I would use uh, Grammarly as a software mm -hmm. that's really great for, um, editing text and grammar and other tools that I would put it to, to make sure that it was optimized for SEO, uh, that the, the header images had the keyword, all the stuff that you need to do to rank well. Um, and so eight to 16 hours for a blog post, this one post that I did with chat GPT, um, I sent it to the subject matter experts, two different ones. There was only two minor changes. Everything in it was factually correct. And, uh, this was, um, you know, confirmed, uh, by one gentleman who had been in the, industry for over 30 years. 
Um, and while it was a low hanging fruit, quote unquote, meaning not a lot of people were looking for the keyword, so I knew I was gonna rank well anyway, it's the fastest I've ever ranked a piece of content in the history wow. of my career. It was on the first page of Google Organics uh, listings uh, within a week, uh, which is stellar. Um, the fastest I had ever done it without that, I believe, was a month. Mm. Now, I can't fully say that ChatGPT did or did not have a, a big effect, but it is the only thing that I did differently. So I do believe there's something to it. When right. it comes to artificial intelligence, whether it's ChatGPT or um, you know some of these uh, AI art generators and they have music generation software, mm -hmm. I'm kind of like, I guess I would say a centrist. There's part of me that is, you know, afraid that this could potentially be the, uh, you know, uh, birth pangs of something like Skynet. And the other part of me thinks that AI, when used properly, could absolutely transform the world, make it a better place uh, and, you know, lead humans to a next step in evolution in one um, idea or another. Um so yeah, I mean that that's where I'm at today today with that. Like having gone through my career using all these softwares, Adobe, um, now today Canva, uh, and some of the other tools, and seeing what AI can do in such a short period of time, um, it's it's frightening, yeah. it's inspiring, it's beautiful, it's terrifying, um, and I, I do know creators who have lost uh, work uh, because uh, they're being replaced. Um, by this, uh, or at least by some of their clients, how widespread that's going to get, how intense, it's hard to say because with Chat GPT, I know that they recently shut off the ability to write in the voice of another author, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, actually, they, but just like everything else, it's how you prompt it. So you can quote get right. around it, but yeah. So, yeah. Um, and I, yeah, so. <laughs> It, you're right. I just gotta, I think what I, I gotta point out real quick. I'm sorry, I don't yeah, mean to you, but uh, that's okay. I, I noticed uh, Rowdy Roddy Piper from the movie They Live uh, at the end there. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. So yeah, this is my <laughs> night cafe uh, AI imaging stuff. And and you know, all right, we're off on a little bit of a side. But what I use it primarily for is I'll grab an image and then run it through one of the artist um, filters, right? Yep. So this, I yep. don't know what this is, an impressionist, whatever, but it seems to be what I use it mostly for, but generating new things. Oh, there's the, the Pink Floyd. Nice. Yeah. Um, well, <clears throat> what I was going to say is, I think what will, I mean, it, when it first hit me and I did, I jumped on it back in December, right? And it seems like forever and a day, but it was just in December. What I got out of it initially was, well, okay, that's going to be the end of copywriting. And I, re I worked for an ad agency a long time ago. And uh, we did the Cougar ads uh, for Lincoln Mercury Cougar. But nice. we also had print and newspaper. So we had a whole division that was the Unit Royal account. And they did copy for those tire ads in the newspaper. And I don't know if you've ever seen one. They're, it's got to be heck on. We, I mean, you know, you're right. You have a picture of a tire pricing mm -hmm. and some tiny little content. Hundreds of these things, right? Yeah. So, you know, that type of copyright is going to go away. Yes. In terms of, it just naturally is. But the way I look at it is, okay, it's going to, what's the word? Um, it's going to strip away the remedial activities that generate some sort of content, right? I don't mm -hmm. want to say the riffraff, but that, yeah. you know, that part's going to go away. But in my opinion, it allows us all to elevate up, right? Mm -hmm. Now, and, and I have to tell you, I used it intensely for three or four weeks, and I'm still in that, that bucket. Um, and I was up to my eyeballs in, in, you know, rewriting and editing and doing all this stuff. And you're right, you take it from a, a week long to do a 600 word blog to a lot less, and mm -hmm. it looks pretty good. <clears throat> um, and then I picked up a, I don't know what book it was, it was a fiction, I think it was a Dean, it was a Coots has got a new horrible he's like a uh, stephen king kind of guy so yeah, i read the like i read the like the very first few pages and i'm thinking there's no way ai is going to hit this there's oh, just yeah. no way and the 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 comparison because i've been up to you know immersed in this uh, chat gpt the way that they write you know i was like reading newspapers or writing newspaper that kind of essays those you can you can spin it a little but then you get into the depth and flavor of a real fiction writer. It's like, whoa, okay. I don't see anything that's going to approach that from, from AI. 
yet. That's my theory. But I still think it can help. And, you know, I will use it to outline, I would use it to outline a novel and then add my prose to it and maybe edit it, and, you know, grammatically, or I think you, grammarly or whatever you, you know, those mm-hmm. things as, as a tool. Um, so I don't see it as a bad thing per se. I see it as a very, very positive thing. And, and we are just at the very, just at the very beginning of where this is going to go. It's in, to me, it's incredible. Um, but talk, so, so what do you think about the music side of it? I haven't delved into that. So um, I, can it? And now this, yeah. What do you think? Well, I, I, I don't remember the name of the software. I only uh, messed around with one, but there are now AI music generators where, uh, again, you can, you can use prompts, um, and there's some other like uh, you know selections you can make by checking off boxes, so it can spit out a song that sounds like a 1950s you know rock and roll tune, um, mm-hmm. you know like something that sounds like the backing track to an Elvis Presley track. I haven't seen it be able to do anything to like pull off you know with a prompt getting something that you might hear from the band Yes or Rush, uh, but I have the feeling it's absolutely going to be going in that direction. Um, from an artist perspective, like I'm not as threatened by it by uh, in the same way that a lot of artists are, um, because it, right now the technology just isn't that great. And you know, my ideal customer profile for what I'm doing isn't going to listen to AI music anyway. Right. For you know, for an artist or someone like a studio musician who exclusively has made a career out of recording. Uh, you know, backing tracks oh, or yeah. uh, medleys for like a McDonald's commercial, this, that, and the other thing that's probably, you know, going to end soon. And for that individual, that's going to suck. Um, but overall, I think if humanity makes the right choices, AI will ultimately be a good thing. It's just, you know, the question I ask is why is there six Jurassic Park films? And it's because humans, uh, you know, uh, as famously said in the first Jurassic Park, you know, you got so carried away with wondering if you could do it, you didn't ask if you should. Mm -hmm. Uh, So there is always that risk um, that, you know, when humans get their hands on a new shiny toy that is extremely powerful, that it could go south if it's not um, taken care of. But having learned what I have about corporate America over the 16 years of my experience, I think that my gut tells me that it's going to be all right. We're going to go in the way of positivity, um, but I can't help as a science fiction fan, you know, think about things like the Terminator or uh, mo- more recently Marvel's Age of Ultron. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think ultimately that's not going to be something that we have to really worry about. And AI will, for the most part, be something that is positive, that helps people. Uh, Yes, it might get rid of some jobs. Hopefully those people who lose their jobs are able to take over other responsibilities, which I hear a lot of companies saying, oh, that's kind of how it's going to shake out. Mm -hmm. Whether or not that's true, that remains to be seen. Yeah, it's interesting. I also think it's interesting that this occurs at this point in history. I mean, we, you know, talk about COVID, the work from home, the work from anywhere, the new awareness that, you know, maybe we shouldn't work 730 to 730 to help other people get rich i mean that's been a a mantra of so many people in the past and you know they've been labeled certain things anti-capitalist but i think what's happening is that people are really starting to wake up or have woken up and i hate to use that word but you know realize (laughs) that yeah um you know the corporate structure is only there to benefit the corporate structure yeah whoa oh yeah (laughs) yeah and I mean, um, you were looking, you were previously looking for a segue into psychedelics, and I think this is right. a perfect opportunity to do that. Um, as a disclaimer, uh, like, I'm not going to talk about the who, what, when, and where. I'm not going to get, you know, really deep on uh, substance specifics, uh, legality at the time of use. Um, uh, but what I will talk about is the overarching benefits, the pearls of wisdom that can be extracted from the psychedelic experience and applied to sales, let, marketing, yeah, and whatever me, career. Absolutely. Let me let me kick this off. By, but and I'm glad you brought the subject up. So I've never and I don't and I haven't and whatever. All right. So and um, the for me personally, the whole movement to bring um, uh, uh, marijuana legally. Right. Colorado is the first state to do it. Now, yep. 
at the point, you know, there was a point in my life when I was like, ah, what are you, no way, that's going to do this, it's going to be that, it's going to be terrible about this, it's going to be that. But then as I listened to the arguments of for doing it, and the, back then I had made, the, well, you know, you're right, it does grow out of the ground like corn and tomatoes. <laughs> so wait a minute. I mean, and then as I, you know, compare that to meth or all these other things that, well, wait, we're creating rat poison? What? <laughs> it's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> so then you take that and then you take, the the and I'll specifically the mushroom thing right mm -hmm. and it's like well wait a minute and then the success quote unquote when they did legalize marijuana in Colorado the state had a certain you know if you want to talk about money and all that stuff yeah they were had a surplus in their budget mm -hmm. and then you get into the whole well you know safe sales went through the roof because well the banks aren't taking their money so okay all right that's a whole nother thing right. but that really opened up going hmm all right well that's interesting and then i think it was rogan i heard it on rogan talking about shrooms and stuff like that and then i yep. all of a sudden started bubbling up in my world my my circles offline online all that and it's like mm -hmm. okay and i don't know what really triggered me to oh god what really got me going was um <laughs> That you might know this story, but the the mushrooms, the red mushrooms, bright red mushrooms, and how they were harvested and dried out on evergreen trees. Mm -hmm. and, Those are yeah, the fly agaric, also known as Amanita muscarias. Yeah, so that's <laughs> okay, and they dried them out. They're bright red on trees, and that's how we evolved into putting decorations on christmas trees i'm going oh, wait there's a, a minute <laughs> there's a lot of myths linking santa claus uh you know the, the combination of white and yellow to the fly agaric uh, also known again as the amanita muscaria particularly in european countries there is artwork for like holiday cards going far far back really uh, that wow. you know i mean th th it's it's probably the most well-known mushroom in the world um which is, you know, like you have, I noticed you have an article up, uh, psilocybin mushrooms. Emanita muscarias uh, are not um, uh, technically illegal, but they are they are dangerous, uh, particularly if you don't know what you're doing. They contain a substance called musical, I believe, and they're delirious. They're not actually psychedelics. Um, I mean, some people would argue that. Uh, but, you know, that's the type of thing that, you know, if you're going into this, the, the, the big thing I would say about psychedelics is that, um, you know, the taboo around them, uh, part of that is acceptable. Part of it is not. And what I mean by that is, uh, abuse, they can absolutely be dangerous. Uh, psychedelics, I would put in the same category as a gun or a car. Uh, you know, how you use that, the training that you take, the precautions that you do, uh, is going to decide whether, you know, you can use that as a tool or you end up hurting yourself or somebody else. Hmm. Um, but mm. like the idea that kind of brought me into segueing here is you were, uh, I forget exactly what you said, but uh, we're talking about industry. Oh, yes. The way the system currently is, you were talking specifically about, uh, you know, how some people are trying to rip people uh, back into the office and are completely mm. shut off to the, uh, you know, the fact that in some cases for some people, this is a productivity increaser and it just makes sense. Right. The system, and when I say the system, I mean everything we know today, our finances, um, spirituality in some ways, uh, you know, work, business ethics. The system right now is working very well for a small group of people. So if you were to introduce something, for example, psychedelics uh, to the public, and people started having ideas that made them say, well, gee, maybe I don't need um, to uh, spend excessive amounts on this, uh, you know, pharmaceutical drug, which has side effects, including uh, breathing problems, uh, heart attack and death, which, you know, you see a pharma pharmaceutical advertised on TV, <laughs> there's always that 30 seconds disclaimer. Um, and there are other things that, you know, these, these substances can absolutely change the way you think. And the conclusions that you can come to in this could result in very large companies taking a huge hit to their revenue streams. Um, so part of the reason why I think they've been illegal for as long as they have is because they are a threat um, to traditional corporations, to traditional uh, religious institutions, uh, and to other entities that like things the way they are. Right. Now, okay, let's back up real quick and just go over what a psychedelic is, right? What does that mean per se? I don't know. Go yeah. ahead. Well, 
there's different classes of psychedelics. A psychedelic drug is um, a substance, whether plant-based, uh, you know, natural or synthetic, uh, that produces an effect that will cause your five senses um, to go through great changes, the altered states of consciousness. Um, so like dreaming would be an altered state of consciousness. Uh, oh, you are entering right. into an experience where, you know, you can have some very strange phenomena. You can uh, see sound, you can taste color. Uh, the bodily sensations, uh, depending upon what you take and how much of it, uh, you know, can make you feel like, although you're standing up, you feel as if you're sitting down. And these are all very like, this isn't like the big things, reasons why people do this. The, the, the thing that, you know, is about psychedelics and why today we are living through the next great psychedelic renaissance uh, which is seeing multiple publicly traded uh, uh, psychedelic medicine companies and the ideal customer profile not being the 21 hip 21 year old hippie at the dead concert but the c-level millionaire executive who's spending five to ten thousand dollars a week once a year flying down to places like south america or subsequently now new hampshire to go on a week-long ahawaska retreat um, but to bring it back to the beginning, a, a psychedelic is essentially a specific hmm. class of drug that produces a hallucinatory experience um, that can result in some of the side effects that I mentioned, synesthesia okay. and um, pareidolia. Uh, so that's, I mean, that's in a nutshell, I guess. It's a big topic and I could go on, but. Well, okay. So yeah, it is a big topic, but, but just for common knowledge, I guess the, the and I could be wrong about this. I, I have heard that yes, it is to be experienced with someone who is experienced and they, you know, the words are shaman and people, you know, like that. Also, I've heard that there isn't any um, permanent damage. So, so I'm not sure how it affects the brain and mm -hmm. puts you in those states, what stimulus it does, but I've heard that it isn't like permanent damage or whatever. You know what I mean? There's not that, that component like other yeah. types of stimulants and things. Is that basically true or am I hearing things yeah. that are, Oh, okay. You know, I'm not a scientist and I'm not an expert or a doctor, right. I um, but yeah. anybody who has access to Google can find uh, the truth about most psychedelics, which if used properly within the specific training, within the right circumstance, set and setting is very important. So if you've never had these experiences before, it makes sense to do it with a sitter, uh, ideally one who is sober. So if you need help, they can assist you. Um, but most of these, uh, the, the traditional psychedelics that, uh, people tend to think of right off the bat, mesculine, which are, comes from peyote buttons, um, LSD, psilocybin mushrooms, and then more obscure substances like salvia divinorum. Um, these are all, uh, being studied and a lot of people don't realize this, but, um, right now, uh, MDMA clinical trials, uh, federal being done by the federal government, um, have been going on for the past, uh, I don't know, three to six years now. Uh, mm. which that process is being headed by a gentleman named Dr. Rick Doblin. He is the CEO of MAPS, the Multiple Disciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. Um, thanks to his work in conjunction with um, a bill that Trump actually signed, it was uh, for experimental medicine usage at uh, chronic end of life experiences. So th this bill that he signed uh, made s chemicals that were previously unable to be studied or accessed available for people who are maybe dying of cancer and it's their last hope. Now the bill wasn't designed uh, to have an effect on psychedelics, but Dr. Richard Dublin, PhD from maps in an interview that I saw recently um, noted that that legislation sort of uh, greatly sped up um, the clinical trials and is why we're starting to see like, you know, both medical and recreational psychedelic um, businesses mm. popping up all over the country. For example, in Massachusetts, um, you can get legal medical psilocybin therapy in Northampton, Cambridge, and Somerville, Mass. These three towns, even though the state hasn't, uh, has uh, legal medical programs, which, you know, the laws are a bit complicated. Um, I'm sorry, I got off, I got off track. I kind of lost That's all right. Thought. No, no, no. We were, we still, I was going to swerve into that anyway. Well, so... That's what a psychedelic is, and you're right. I'm hearing more and more about it. Um, I think Utah's studying some something legislative way, and to stay away from that though for now because that's going to come up no matter what. And right. same thing. I want to go back. I mean, you're right about the corporate structure. 
Um, boy, that's a good subject, though. So, so yes, any shock to the system, the system being the status, and I can't believe I'm saying this, the status quo, the establishment, the whole thing that we've mm-hmm. been hearing people protest against <laughs> since five, from the 60s, right? That's what, you know, oh, the man's going to get you. All that stuff that through the 70s and the 80s and into the 90s, yeah, they're just crazy long hairs. They don't know what they're talking about. They're going to you know, go smoke some more dope and roll around right. the mud. We're, we're making deals and sending people to the moon and making big, fast jets and all that stuff. <laughs> well, oh, no, oh, by the way, UFOs aren't real, right? They're swamp gas. <laughs> they're balloons. For 50 years, we've been told that. So now you come into the – and this – now we're going to get real heady now. We, we come into this age where – where we had to go through that age to get to the, the the hierarchies had to be built. There had to be structure to get us us being who we are uh, to where we are right now, to where we can understand and realize that that structure we've outgrown. Yeah. All right. Now there's going to be as all growth pains. There's going to be resistance. But my point is, and it goes back to these UFOs. I don't even care if you believe them or not. It doesn't matter. What matters to me is that for 50 years we were told they don't exist. Okay. Right. They don't. And at Air Force, governments, boom, boom, boom. Meanwhile, Hollywood's, you know, going nuts and crazy, showing us that, you know, aliens are everywhere from E.T. to, you know, ID4. Um, and then all of a sudden, it seemed all of a sudden, there's these pilots, naval fighters that are telling us, well, we've got these things that are floating around. They're going really fast. And then now, in the last few years, Senate hearings. We don't call them UFOs. They're UA, whatever, the UAP, whatever. The, the mm-hmm. thing is... That it now comes out that I think someone actually said it. They're non-terrestrial. And mm-hmm. okay. So everyone goes, oh, that's cool. They're real. Well, no, no, no. For 50 years they told it. What else have they been telling us? Right. I that- mean, I was I was surprised that, you know, because this was all over the major media and nobody talked about it. Like, you know, I have friends who, you know, are kind of all about this. And right. it, it was like not a big deal. And it's like, well, how is it not a big deal? But, you, I mean, you can look it up. The Washington Post, the New York Times, the you know, the, the fighter jet uh, situation that you're talking about has been mm-hmm. all over major media. And it's just for whatever reason seems to has fallen on deaf ears. It's like, oh, it's not a big deal. And it's like, I, I think it probably should be a big deal. It should be. Now, you can get into the whole pre-programming and, you know, not, you know compared to what? Compared to a global pandemic, compared to you know pedo island oh, you know, whatever the media is hammering out there and oh yeah by the way flying saucers are real yeah but there, there's a global pandemic going on and you know you know whatever 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 so yeah it kind of slipped in to the public mm-hmm. psyche and right. and i think there may even be less resistance to the idea like okay that's cool there's ufos like kids like yeah i mean younger generations like, yeah all right i mean i've watched x files sure yeah it's real oh okay no biggie and where we think, well, what the hell? <laughs> That's yeah. a big deal. Um, so, all right. So that, to me, falls into the, the, the con- this convergence of issues that mm-hmm. now psychedelics are coming up as, mm-hmm. as it, like everything else, working out of your home, working out through then in a super duper skyscraper that was built to house drones and push paper. That's right. now, hmm, maybe we don't have to do that. So all of this is starting to, to come bubbling up. And, you know, the generational thing, which I hate. I hate demographics that cause generational conflict, right? Yeah. I don't, we're all in the, we're not in the same boat. We're on the same ocean, guys. So whatever. I don't care how old or how young you are. We're, we're all in the same storm. So just deal with it. <laughs> um, where's, there's a question in here somewhere, Nathan. I forget where it is, but there's something. Um Okay, yeah, can I stop you for one second? Um, Please I do. <laughs> I, got, uh, I got to run to the bathroom. It's right behind me. I'll oh, right okay. Well, good. Then I shall continue on. So as I was saying, this part, and, and when Nathan comes back, I'm going to hit him up with this. So if you're a child, a boomer, or an uh, mid to late 60s, right, born then, you may or may not remember the play – hair and the whole hippie movement and all that stuff and something in there called the age of aquarius now i'm not going to get all woohoo and strange and astrological but (laughs) when you look at what that philosophy is in the in in the rearview mirror it's like okay we're moving into the quote age of aquarius from what what age did we move from and i don't even remember what it was but the age prior to quote aquarius which is just think of it as a time span right from 
don't know, from Jesus Christ to 1969, whatever. Um, mankind evolved and created systems, hierarchies, uh, corporations, whatever you want to call it, political systems, stuff like that, that allowed us to evolve culturally, technologically, economically, beyond anything we had done in the past. And in theory, now that we've gone through those steps, we are at this point in history, that now the next step is the, the Aquarian age, and that pretty much challenges everything that we've done in the past with whatever the future is and we don't know yet. And if you look at what's happened since, you know, believe it or not, since the year 2000, I mean, you can even throw in when Trump got elected and the political upheaval that it didn't just affect people in Delaware and Georgia and Alaska and California, New York, Michigan, all over. It was a global impact. And then you roll in the COVID, the fear of COVID, the pandemic, the reaction to that. We're, we're, we're in a collision course with something that we haven't ever seen before. And we're starting to challenge what we have done in the past. So that's where we're at. And I think COVID and the, you know, in the small, you know, boil it all the way down into, you know, office technology, because it isn't that everyone's working from it. There's a whole nother mentality, a value system that's coming about because of the, the big change. And, and Nathan, I was just talking about how the, the you know, the going from into the age of the Aquarius, you know, the whole sixties hair, the, 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 uh, that whole production. Yeah. And, and how, I, you know, if whether you believe it or not, or whether you're into that or not, if you look at just the way that they are structurally described, and then you look in the past and go, oh, well, yeah, if you just take it black and white on paper, hmm, those were, that was the age of, and now Aquarian means this, 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 and this, and go, huh, well, that looks like what we're doing, so what came first? Anyway, so um, what were we talking about before you did your bio break? What was it? Something good. I mean, we had been discussing sort of the corporate structure that right. stands to, to lose should psychedelics, uh, you know, become more um, accepted both medically and recreationally. Right, and 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 sorry to say, that's a sad, that's the same old story. That's the uh, what is the military whatever thing that military Johnson industrial talked. complex. Yeah, I mean that's similar, different, but it is an industrial complex of some yeah. sort that we have to go on. But to boil it down, even you know more tactically, so. Here's the question. Seriously. So if if one were to what re, not real world, what value mm -hmm. do those experiences can those experiences bring an individual and maybe even apply it to everyday tactical life? If, for instance, I go out and I do this on a Friday night, what's Monday morning? What value do I now have I gleaned mm -hmm. in whatever currency because of that quote? trip and i hate using that word but because of that experience where's that at nathan how, how do we derive some sort of value yeah and i mean trip isn't a dirty word and okay. uh, it might be to some people now but uh, we, we are living through the beginning of a of a psychedelic renaissance hmm. and you know as i said before right now the ideal customer profile for a lot of these companies that are currently or are getting ready to sell psychedelic medicine either for medical reasons or recreational, the ideal customer profile is the multi-millionaire C-level executive, particularly for substances uh, like ahuasca, which is um, a brew made from two different types of vines and other plants in the Amazon uh, and contains a drug called dimethyltryptamine, um, which is a psychedelic. When we're talking about psychedelics, whether it's LSD, psilocybin, um, DMT, and there's a whole host of these substances naturally and synthetic, uh, the, the drive behind this going into this new psychedelic renaissance, um, again, is not targeting, you know, the hippie kids partying at a Grateful Dead show. Um, it's, it's focused on these, uh, the C-level executive who wants to improve their business. Um, and the thing about the psychedelic experience is you can microdose, which means taking such a small amount that you have zero psychedelic experience, but you still get the positive side effects such as uh, help dealing with anxiety, depression, PTSD. And the last one there, um, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, MDMA uh, is a substance that's being uh, used for that. Within two years, it will be federally medically legal. Um, I kind of got off main topic there. Right. But so if you were to take, 
you know, a dose. It really depends on the substance. It depends on how much of it you take. It depends on, you know, the information where you're uh, getting instructions from. But let's just say you take, um, <clears throat> you know, enough to have a full-blown psychedelic experience. Uh, the experience begins very much so uh, visually. Um, one of the common things that you'll experience is uh, the presence of self-animating, self-simulating uh, fractal patterns. Are you familiar with fractals? Uh, Perhaps the yes. Mandelbrot set? Right. Okay. So one of the things that seems to be fairly universal, um, which is there's not a lot because everyone's experience is going to be completely unique and different. Um, but uh, every physical surface um, at a specific level of the experience will have visible fractal patterns that are self, uh, self-creating, self-animated, uh, and uh, growing exponentially. Um, while that's happening, you will have uh, an equivalent emotional experience in which you're going through a myriad of emotions. Uh, and depending upon the intensity of the experience, that could be anything from joy and bliss uh, to terror and fear. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, physical sensations uh, can be anything from comfort to feeling as if your body has become an object that is not the shape of your body. Um, but the real reason why the, you know, sea level millionaire executive is flying yeah. down to South America, you know, or going over the border in New Hampshire, cause they have one up there now, um, is because most of the time, I think what they're chasing is uh, a phenomenon called ego death. Ego death, uh, is a experience that can happen at larger uh, doses of psychedelics in which everything you know about yourself dissolves to the point where you literally cannot remember your own name and you no longer have words to even think to yourself of what's going on. In this state, you become painfully aware of your insignificance, you know, being this tiny dot on a tiny dot that is in a sea of billions of tiny dots. Of course, I'm talking about the universe. Uh, and during this experience, you might have a visual, an emotional, or a spiritual um, uh, experience in which you see and feel the interconnectedness of all living things, of us to our fellow man, of the earth chemically and the universe atomically. Uh, and it's hard to put into words exactly what you're seeing and what you're feeling, because again, everyone who's doing this is going to have a completely unique experience unto themselves based on their own biology and their subconscious mind. Um, but you know, when Monday morning rolls around, depending right. upon you, ho how you go about doing this, which I would like to add a caveat, there's no reason to use psychedelics illegally today. Um, there are various substances that are completely legal. Uh, there are places where you can medically uh, and recreationally take these substances completely legal. So I, I certainly don't condone, you know, the idea of uh, breaking the law. And because we are living through this uh, next iteration of the psychedelic uh, renaissance, um, there's no reason to break the law. So when you take that substance on a Friday night, you're going to have a life changing experience, which, uh, you know, absolutely should be done at home or not, um, you know, using a motor vehicle or doing anything that you wouldn't do after you had, you know, a six pack of beer. Okay. But the benefits you're going to reap from that is going to be profoundly significantly better than that six pack of beer, which really ultimately, um, you know, I mean, alcohol is a literal poison. Um, not bashing it. I, I, I drink for I years. I, I yeah. don't currently drink. Um, I actually, you know, one of the benefits of psychedelics for me was quitting alcohol, which was problematic for me. I also quit using nicotine from using that. Um, but as far as the stuff that you can apply to your role as a sales professional or marketing, uh, right. first things first, the visual aspect is so incredibly mind blowing that um, it is absolutely useful to the graphic designer or any visual artist, oh. um, you know, and, it, you know, there was a time like 15 years ago, having conversations like this were so much harder because you couldn't point to something and say, well, at least from a visual perspective, here's what it's like. So a couple examples of what an experience that you could potentially have. Um, there's a, a movie called Renegade, also known as Blueberry. It's a little known Western about a guy who falls in love with a woman, has this traumatic experience and ends up uh, after getting into a fight uh, in the middle of the desert left to die. He's uh, found by a shaman uh, who hurt, nurses him back to health and trains him how to use, I think in the film, it, it, was, uh, it was either peyote or San Pedro cactus. 
the visuals in that are the closest thing I have ever seen. So uh -huh. it's a good representation. But for something, you know, because that's like that's like a cult film. You know, you either you either know it or you don't. Let's go to something a little bit more accessible to the general masses. Mm -hmm. So the first Doctor Strange film, have you seen that? Yes, the first one. We Yes, the first one. So when the Ancient One touches his third eye with her thumb and his soul gets blasted out of his body and then immediately mm -hmm. after is sucked into that, you know, experience where he's flying all around and where all those right. hands come out that like grab him and suck him back inside. That is the type of thing that you can expect happening to you. Um, granted, you, you might think, well, is it going to physically transport me? No, obviously not. But if you close your eyes, uh, that is absolutely something that you could experience on a potent dose of various psychedelics. Wow. Okay. So visually I get it. So if I'm into graphics arts and I could come away with something like that. Yeah. So then, and it sounds like it's more of a, it is a personal journey. So mm -hmm. then Monday more. So, so yeah, what are these millionaires? And I'm guessing that they are high end, high driving corporate leaders right and i'm thinking of yep. the show the hell was it i think it might have been billions and i'm not sure if he did it in there but you yeah. know we're, we're 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 trying to monitor a dozen different data streams and you know millions of dollars right. lots of pressure is is it their takeaway a a deeper level of um i don't know of a re relaxation to cut away from all those pressures for a few and then, then take that experience and, and that call, is it more of a calming effect or are they using it to open up even more avenues of awareness that they can bring into the real world and process even more? I mean, what, right. Was, oh, yeah. Wow, I think, I think, question. yeah, I think it's probably more of the latter. Um, mm -hmm. If you are the type of millionaire C-level executive who is going to take Ahawaska in the jungle or some other place where it's legal, you're probably doing it primarily to uh, get a one-up on your competitors because you're looking for something that'll give you an edge. Maybe mm -hmm. you're thinking, well, if I can change my mind, then I can change results. Um, but it, you see relaxation. There are certainly moments in the experience that are incredibly relaxing and okay. some, and some, ex, and some experiences may be more relaxing because your set and setting is at home uh, with a, a notepad and drawing materials and your favorite music. Maybe you have some Pink Floyd on in the background. That's going to be a very different experience than if you're with a group of people you don't know in the middle of the Amazon uh, with a shaman chanting over you. Uh, but, you know, what that person is going to bring back, the, the, the gems of wisdom that can be extracted from the experience, as I, as I said earlier, the, the two biggest things I notice are empathy. Um, your empathy gets like an injection of a 1000% increase. And the, the big takeaway that I've talked to everybody um, as far as things that are generally universal is the understanding the intricate interconnectedness of everything. Okay. Now you can talk about that from a scientific perspective. You can be like, yeah, you know, uh, technically, you know, we're, you and I are two separate people, but there's invisible connections between us, whether that's emotional or, you know, how extraviolet light uh, is, you know, uh, touching our bodies, but we can't see that because our eyes are limited to the spectrum. Um, one of the, the key one of the keys that people are really searching for, and I think particularly this new ideal customer profile that I'm talking about, is having a better understanding of the interconnectedness of all things. Because if you do that, one byproduct is you're going to become more empathetic naturally because you you see and you experience um, the interconnectivity of all life in the universe in a way that you could not otherwise. And relaxing, generally speaking, no. The psychedelic okay. experience, right. and it's very important that I get this across, it is not for the weak. It's not for the weak-minded. It's not for the weak of spirit. It's not for the energetically weak. This is an initiatory experience that will test you and push you to your limits in a way that no experience in your life, sans maybe the death of a loved one, uh, the birth of your child, or falling in love uh, affected your life. It's going to be up there for most people in that so you do kind of have to figure out, um, you know, is this, is this right for me? Because it could be a mistake if you go into this willy nilly, just thinking like, oh, it's just like anything else. It's like smoking a joint at a party. No, it's not. You're going to have a transpersonal experience that puts you in connectivity with reality in a completely different way. And when you come back, while the experience will end, 
you are forever changed. You right. will you will you will have an experience of the physical reality that we experience through our bodies that is completely different from people who never have these experiences. And that experience and that difference, uh, at least for me, gives you um, a unique perspective on the world that allows you to think in ways that others don't, to think of things that right. others won't. Right. <clears throat> to see things because it's all about perspective. So I, let me try to try trans. I think you, for me at least, you hit it real good. Is it does the empathy empathy side right now when you when somebody sees a vision that is literally interconnects everything. I mean, we're down to the quantum level. Not everyone reads these things and understands right. or can even yeah. wants to, right? Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but once you see it and experience it, whether it's in your head or w whatever, what even even on a very, 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 very shallow, if there were a movie that somehow conveyed that to this particular person, oh, there's just a little bit of empathy that is in, initiated from that experience on the screen. I can only mm -hmm. imagine we're now we're in the multi-dimensional, full-on experience. Um, yeah, and it's but you know you are small, we are small, we're all here together. The whole connectivity thing has got to be extremely enlightening. And th isn't that really where everything was going? Anyway? I mean, when when you talk about super enlightened, in, in, enlightened individual, the third eye, the whole thing, that's where they try and get. I think. Is that Buddha or whatever? When you try and get mm -hmm. into the, you know, I am nothing phase, whatever. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah, well, where you want to go. Wow. Go on. Yeah. I mean, I actually refer to the psychedelic experience as cheating the Buddha because <laughs> it's a, a shortcut. <laughs> I mean, it is for, you know, for some people. And again, it's a, it's a highly personal experience. Your experience is not going to be the same as the person next to you. Uh, and your experience today is not going to be the same as the one that you have next time. If there's a next time, you know, people who don't understand or know anything about psychedelics, when I have conversations like this, will ask, well, are they addicting? Absolutely not. They might be psychologically addicting to people mm. who are really all about it. But the experience is generally so intense and traumatic, even if it's a good experience, that when you're done, the last thing you're thinking about is going back anytime soon. Hmm. That's interesting. That's real interesting. So it is experiential in the sense that you are taking something from it. you're getting something from it that does. Mm -hmm. And there's no need in the back of your brain to go do it again. Right. Oh, unless you want to get something. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's there's that part of it. So I would imagine and I could be wrong. It may be like uh, parachutes. If you you know, if you jump out of a plane once, there's a heck of an experience. Some people get hooked on the address, whatever. But if I want to go experience it again, that doesn't mean I, you know, I'm very interested in, in that particular, call it a hobby or whatever, right? It, it's something that I, I enjoy doing, but there's no chemical, re no, there might be, there's no, I'm not dependent on the substance. I am not even dependent, but I wish to experience it because of this, this, and this, not because I don't have, a, you know, I can't understand why, but I need to have that vodka at nine o'clock in the morning or whatever. It's not like that. Is that, that's right, right? That's correct. Yeah, not at all. I mean, again, it's hard to put these things into words, but like, yeah, you know, yeah. on average, I would say since I was 15, these experiences might occur in my life every seven years or so. So mm -hmm. these are not things like, oh, I'm going to, I just did this and now I want to do it 50 times next right. week. Uh, right. To to totally not that at all. And particularly with the natural uh, psychedelics plant teachers as they're often referred to by people in uh, you know the community um, the medicine itself uh, particularly if you're talking about something like psilocybin or salvia divinorum salvia divinorum it can absolutely feel like there is an intelligence present in natural psychedelics that are maybe missing from synthetic alternatives um, you know, this is getting on the borderline of talking about spirit you know do you believe in spirits do you not and um, I'm not going to dig too deep into that, but mm -hmm. it does feel as if you're having a communication with something outside of you um, it, sometimes with these experiences. And it's another reason why, you know, psychedelics uh, are illegal and have been illegal, I think, is because they pose a very real threat to um, the continuation of religion as we know it. Oh, <clears throat> Many people, many people uh, who have experiences like this 
often come to the conclusion that they've had a direct experience with God itself, whatever that means to that person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, if there is a way to easily connect directly with divinity and you come to the conclusion, you know, I'm connected to God in a way that I could never be separated and never was if God does exist and you don't feel the need to go to mass every Sunday, that's going to really cut into the profit margins of the church. Absolutely. Yeah. It's just another corporate structure. It really is. I mean, not the, but you know, it does serve a purpose for people who, and it yes. did serve a purpose. It's, it's like I was discussing yeah. while you were gone. It's that, that served a purpose that we had to go through yeah. um, before. And we it still get does for side. a lot of people. You Absolutely. Know, that's, you know, you know, you know, I respect, need that. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I respect people who, who, who go to church and do the right thing with it. You know, um, if it's the thing that makes them feel compelled to donate to charity, if it's the thing that, that makes them compelled to be kinder to their neighbor, right. You know, more power to you all, you know, great respect for you. If you have a faith and it helps you to be a better person. Um, but I will say that, you know, and we'll probably start seeing a lot of this once um, particularly recreational access begins, you know, people are going to talk about these experiences mm. uh, in a way that they never have. Like, you know, if you go digging in Google, you can certainly find communities where there's mm. thousands of pages of in-depth, very intricate trip reports, people talking about exactly everything they experienced from, you know, the, the beginning to the end. And I mean... There's really? there's the hundreds of thousands of these stories on the internet, but it you know um, the potential for these substances uh, to completely alter the way that you think about work, about spirituality, um, about self care. Uh, these are things that can cause major major changes in the individual, and as more people access these things, are absolutely going to be completely disruptive to the industries connected to those things. Right. Wow. That's a that's a very valid point. I just had a weird thought. It's like instead of going, not instead, sales trainings, right? Remote sales training. You go away for three days and learn how to sell. All right. Well, maybe part of that should be what we'll call it a self awareness trip or whatever. Mm -hmm. I could see that. Mm. It, you know, because I could only imagine as a professional salesperson, and again, this is for me, it may not be for anyone else, but. Once, because empathy is very, very valuable in that process of talking to people and helping people make decisions and then making a living from that. You have to be empathetic with their situation. You have to put yourself, you have to, you should professionally put yourself in their shoes to help them make a decision or not, or to help them make a decision and not be emotionally attached to the results of that decision. So it's mm. pure empathetic. So if if there were some tool out there that would help salespeople expand their empathy and the powers behind that, I would say that's a pretty good thing. And you're not going to find that on an agenda or a, or a whiteboard or in a PowerPoint. You will talk about it, but it'll die right then and there. So, boy, that's that would be a major left turn. And I bet you someone's already doing it already for their higher end, quote unquote, bigger. I don't know. Maybe you know some selling professionals are going away on these retreats and going down to the Amazon and coming back. And now oh, they're yeah. completely, completely connected to this point that, well, I don't even need to sell anymore. I'm totally fine. I got this. You know, it's not about that. So anyway. I mean, some people do leave their careers after doing it because <laughs> of the insights that they have. Um, you know, other people go the opposite direction and supercharge their careers. Dive right so in. Go from zero to 60, even if they were already successful. Um, mm. And, you know, it's a per it, it is it is a personal. extremely personal experience. You know, someone might be like, oh, you shouldn't do that. Uh, when I was 16, I, I took this thing without I just I trusted my friend and I it was horrible. And it's like, yeah, that mm -hmm. shit happens. Like you can't be you can't be stupid with this stuff. Just like any chemical, like, you know, as far as I'm concerned, uh, before I started smoking cigarettes, I did. Uh, when I was a, a teenager, I did in-depth research about how nicotine affects the body. Um, you know, what other ingredients are they putting in it, which at the time mm -hmm. they didn't have the organic cigarettes nowadays that you can get. Mm -hmm. It's very important, whether it's a cigarette, a cup of coffee, if you're taking a nighttime medication to sleep, to thoroughly educate yourself. And most people don't. And that is part of the reason that these substances are illegal is because, well, I, I, I guess I'll quote the Bible. Don't cast your pearls before swine. Now, in the context I'm using it, what's that saying is you can't just hand these experiences out to everyone without any regulation, because if the village idiot gets their hands on it, 
they could cause extremely significant problems for themselves and others. Right. But in, in, in a professional setting or after you have gone through extensive uh, training for personal use and how to do it appropriately, you know, how to do it with a sitter, you know, uh, to go through all the protocols and do your research before you can absolutely, uh, you know, have this experience and have it transform various aspects of your personhood and your career. But, mm -hmm. you know, just mm -hmm. like a gun or a car, if you, if you, you know, you get, you drink a bottle of an entire bottle of whiskey before you get in your car and go driving, there's a huge probability you could hurt yourself or somebody else. Right. Yeah. Same thing. Wow. Well, Nathan, I mean, I just looked at the clock. I appreciate it. It's 20. I don't put a back end on this, but because uh, topics can get like we just get into. So, but mm -hmm. I think that's a great place to end it. I dude, sure. this has been fascinating right something you don't hear very often at all especially in the context of our of our little industry yeah. but something i think and i know you do is at the edge of not even reality it is reality i think there's something here that's going to happen you're right it's going to you know we're, we're on the cusp we're on the event horizon and it's happening and i just hope that you know we can bring these words out to other people in the industry and and just think about it that's all we're not you know yeah like if it's not your, like, you know, I would yes. never tell someone I, like I don't like if I if I am at a party and I meet a new person and we start talking about, you know, things that are on this, I wouldn't be like, oh, dude, you should totally do X. No, I don't pre you know, I'm not preaching the gospel of psychedelics. If somebody comes to me and they say, hey, there's something about you and the way you think and talk that, it, you know, makes me think like, you know, you know, how can I get inside your head? What makes you tick? Mm -hmm. And, you know, if a conversation goes to the point where it's like, all right, this person has already experienced, or, you know, they have extensive uh, experience with cannabis, it, there's certain ways that you can gauge that. But I don't go around telling people like, oh, every, like, I'm not Timothy Leary. It's not like everybody should do this because there are absolutely people who should not. But right. at the end of the day, um, these are uh, things that can produce absolutely incredible positive transformational experiences and while it is still kind of taboo uh and like stigmatized we are at the at, at a point in time where that shift is going to happen and it's going to happen a lot quicker than i thought it would within the next uh i'd say seven to 14 years <laughs> um this conversation is going to seem not cutting edge at all by yeah. the time that goes Trivial. around yeah and uh yeah, hopefully we'll be able to do it again at some point in the future. Well, I think so too. All right, Nathan, I appreciate it. Let's um, we'll call it a day here. But thank you very much, dude. I appreciate it. Good luck with everything. Um, if anyone has any questions, hit me up with an email, or I'll get you in touch. Check us out on LinkedIn. I know you're there, Nathan. For that, for now, good afternoon. Go enjoy yourself, and um, thank everyone for taking a look at it. Thanks, Greg. Have a great Thank day. You. you too.